to begin with lecture four and this lecture. Lecture four, you guys ready? We're good? Okay. Lecture four, Holdrick Zwingli, His Life and Teaching. Seven months after Martin Luther was born, Holdrick Zwingli was born on New Year's Day in 1484 in Switzerland. Zwingli, in time, would become the second most important first-generation reformer after Luther, and his influence on the shape of Protestant Christianity has been very great. For that reason, I want to devote this lecture to him and see in what ways we can continue to learn from his life and teaching. As a Swiss man, Zwingli was born into a very patriotic and independent-minded people. Many of the Swiss of his time were people born and bred in the country, spending much of their time in the beautiful atmosphere under the Swiss Alps. Many young men would develop into excellent soldiers, and so the Swiss were coveted by neighboring political forces for military mercenary services. In fact, the popular phrase, the Swiss are coming, comes from the historical fact that the Swiss were powerfully skilled warriors and a much feared force to be reckoned with. The image of warfare would play large in Zwingli's life. In fact, his life would end on a battlefield. But as he began his reform movement in Switzerland, he increasingly saw himself more as a soldier of Christ and Christ's gospel than as a chess piece in the hands of the highest bidder for worldly warfare. One of the biggest changes in his mind about how the Swiss should utilize their military skills came during a battle where he was serving as a chaplain. The battle was called the Battle of Marinano of 1515 that took place in northern Italy. Zwingli saw 10,000 of his Swiss compatriots die in that battle as he went from body to body administering last rites as a Catholic priest. It was at that time that he began to become disillusioned with the way warfare was glorified and he truly saw, as the American general William Sherman once said, that war is hell. At the same time of that battle, Zwingli had been an ordained priest for 10 years. And when he got back to his home church, his congregation didn't take well to his new political convictions that the Swiss should primarily have their military focus on defense and get rid of their mercenary practices. He thought he was being patriotic and preaching against that practice, and he thought he was going to save many Swiss lives. But many of his congregants believed he was being unpatriotic. And for that reason, he got the boot from them in 1516. And 1516 was truly the time when Zwingli was beginning to discover the gospel in a deeper way for himself, as well as beginning to have convictions about the need for a lot of reform in the church. Seeing that this was a year before Luther nailed his 95 theses on the Wittenberg door and began to attract fame outside of Germany, Zwingli was not so much a disciple of Luther as much as someone who grew up alongside of him with similar discoveries, convictions, and leadership ability to enact reform. Now we saw last month that the most famous scholar in Europe at the time was a man by the name of Desiderius Erasmus. One of Erasmus's proverbs was, war is pleasant only for the inexperienced. Zwingli had that sentence in Erasmus's book underlined. He knew by experience it wasn't pleasant. While it is common to see Zwingli caricatured as a man who was very militaristic, that isn't really true. A famous statue of him shows him with the Bible in one hand and a sword in the other. And he is at many times said to have died with a sword, or in some people's stories, an axe head in one hand. But that is misleading. The sword that he died in battle with was just a ceremonial sword. And him being out there in the field of battle was for spiritual support. Zwingli's true allegiance didn't lie with any Swiss mercenary force, but rather with the army of the Lord. The battle for the gospel and the desire to see greater purity within Christ's church that had fallen on some hard times in the late medieval period. But we're getting too far ahead of ourselves, and let's look at the central achievements of Zwingli's life, which mainly began when he was 32 years of age in the year 1516. At that point, he had already been a priest for 10 years and had been deeply engaged in furthering his studies 
by reading and meeting with leading scholars that would come to Switzerland. It was during 1516 when Zwingli got hold of Erasmus's newly published Greek New Testament that he copied the entire New Testament out by hand in Greek, memorized most of it, and put copious notes in the margins of his copied text. I have a picture here of Zwingli's notes. It's been preserved through the ages, and here's a picture you can see. That's his copied out Greek New Testament with notes that he wrote in Latin and the margins. He was immersing himself in the scriptures. This period of memorizing the scriptures in their original language would be foundational for Zwingli as he moved forward as an important reformer in the church. It was the scriptures first and foremost that he would appeal to before appealing to any church father or church tradition. He was a man of the word. In fact, one of his most enduring works was a collection of sermons that he preached at a famous nunnery that was filled with women from well-to-do families. The collection of sermons is titled, Of the Clarity and Certainty of the Word of God. In that work, he says, quote, In his word, we can never go astray. We can never be deluded or confounded or destroyed in his word. A little later in the work, he says, quote, For the word of God is certain and can never fail. It is clear and will never leave us in darkness. It teaches its own truth. It arises and irritates the soul of man with full salvation and grace. It gives the soul sure comfort in God. Because Zwingli had such strong conviction in the need for people to hear God's word and have it expounded to them, one of the first reforms that he was able to enact was having the word taught in an expository fashion. It was on Zwingli's 35th birthday in 1519 that he was appointed the people's priest in the great cathedral of the city of Zurich. The first thing Zwingli did was to turn to the first page of the New Testament and begin to teach. So he taught through the book of Matthew, then jumped ahead to the book of Acts, following that with the pastoral epistles, which were the latest epistles of Paul. He wanted people to get a historical grounding of the story of the New Testament first before he went back and taught through the rest of the New Testament. And it took him six years to teach through the New Testament. That was something that was only happening in the world right there in Zurich, really, at that time in 1519. Wittenberg was doing something similar, but not quite like that. Zwingli believed that the way the church was going to be renewed and not led astray was by a greater emphasis on the scriptures and far less reliance on the Pope and all of the Pope's traditions. Zwingli writes this, quote, The church rests upon the word of God alone, which is so firm and immovable that heaven and earth must pass away sooner than one jot of it. On the contrary, the church of the pontiffs rests upon its own word. They run, indeed, as if they had been sent by the Lord, But they speak visions, that is, things pleasing to their own heart. Hence they spread nothing but darkness before poor wretches' eyes. But Zwingli was not just someone who had memorized the New Testament and had desired that people only read Scripture. He also had read extensively from early Greek and Roman authors and was well-versed in early church fathers. In 1520, he began to read extensively from Augustine. And later he would say that it was through Augustine and the Gospel of John that he began to understand the the power of the gospel. If one reads Zwingli's work, they will see that it is sprinkled with regular quotes from all over the gospel of John. You will see regular appeals to John 3.16. Evangelicals who emphasize that verse in many ways have Zwingli as a forerunner. John 3.16 is gospel compacted with no added human traditions or works of the law. But on top of loving the gospel of John... The Zwinglian scholar, Jim West, says that Zwingli also had a theme verse from another gospel, the gospel of Matthew. And he said the theme verse was Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jim West, the Zwinglian scholar, writes this, quote, Zwingli chose this particular verse because in that great invitation of Jesus, he found both relief and comfort. He knew that burdens what burdens were, and he struggled with them his entire ministerial life. He also knew that solace couldn't be found outside of Christ. Come to me, rang constantly in his ear. It really is a very fine and profoundly meaningful text. One of the events 
that catapulted Zwingli into controversy was something that took place during Lent of 1522. The printer of Zurich, Christopher Froschauer, loved printing Zwingli's books, and he invited Zwingli and a group of other men over to his house for a sausage supper during Lent. Zwingli watched as these men broke the church's rules by eating a piece of sausage, and it pleased Zwingli. Two weeks later, he preached a sermon titled this, On the Choice and Freedom of Food. In laying down verse after verse that pointed to people being able to be free in what they ate, Zwingli said the Lenten traditions were, quote, the foulness of human commands, and that if we simply follow Christ, we will, quote, feel the sweetness of his yoke and the lightness of his burden. He also said this, if you like to fast, do it. If you don't like to eat meat, don't eat it, but do not touch a Christian's freedom. That was essential for Zwingli. A year later, in 1523, Zwingli attended the first of three disputations. Here he presented 67 articles of faith, which he would later comment on and expand his thoughts about in a book called The Defense of the Reformed Faith. I want to give a few snippets from this work. Here's his fifth article. Five, therefore, all who regard other teachings equal to or higher than the gospel err. They do not know what the gospel is. He comments saying this, quote, Christ is your salvation. You are nothing and are not capable of anything. Christ is the beginning and the end. He is all and able to do all. Trust him in your salvation, for everything else will deceive you. Christ, the righteous and blameless one, purifies you. He is the righteousness of us all and all those who have been found righteous before God. His 16th article was this, 16. In the gospel, we learn that human teaching and statutes are of no use to salvation. In his comments on this article, he talks about the hypocrisy of showmanship Christianity and how people place confidence in the silliest of religious rituals. He says this, quote, Now we mumble, then we cry, now we don't eat eggs, then we stuff ourselves again. We are so pleased with ourselves in this tomfoolery that we actually think ourselves to be pious even though God denounces it all. Later on, he says this, quote, Humanly invented statutes and commandments appear to be beautiful to human eyes, but inwardly they are empty, vain, barren, and useless. For where the Spirit of God is not, there is nothing other than falseness, hypocrisy, despair, and a condemned and terrible conscience are to be found. How did anyone dare chain the mercy and grace of God to their laws and imprison them in such a way that they would open them only to those who listen to their trifling? Later on, these articles, while talking about how people place their confidence in the intercessions of saints and in any other mediator than Jesus Christ, Zwingli says this, quote, It becomes apparent then how these foolish papists have maliciously turned God's kindness into disfavor. They have turned a kind, gracious father into an angry judge and tyrant. No wonder people wanted to run to Mary and the saints instead of to Jesus. Zwingli was adamant that the church didn't hold the church, um, the, the church didn't hold uh, the keys to Christ's forgiveness. In his 50th article, he says this, 50. God alone remits sins through Jesus Christ, his Son, our only Lord. Speaking about the keys of the kingdom, which the Catholic Church said only the Pope and his ordained priests held to remit people's sins through confession, Zwingli thinks that is ridiculous. Commenting on this article, he says this, quote, The keys are none other than the preaching of the pure, undefiled word of the gospel. Whoever believes in it is freed from sins and becomes whole, but whoever does not believe shall be condemned. The gospel is the only key that unlocks the promises of heaven, not some special group of men ordained by the Pope. Here are a few other articles in the 67 articles. Article 17, Christ is the one eternal high priest. Article 24, Christians are not bound to any works which Christ has not commanded. Article 26, nothing is more displeasing to God than hypocrisy. Article 49, I know of no greater 
scandal than the prohibition of lawful marriage to priests, while they are permitted for money to have concubines. Shame. The theme of getting rid of human traditions played big in Zwingli's reform program, bigger than even in Luther's reform program. Zwingli felt that if something wasn't explicitly commanded to be done in worship service in the New Testament, then it shouldn't be done. They removed the church's organs from the churches in Zurich, as well as all the religious arts and statues. Even though Zwingli played ten instruments and was said to have been a gifted singer, he would not have musical instruments as part of the worship service. The only thing he allowed was the singing of psalms. This was pretty a pretty radical New Testament biblicism, and many of his later followers would not agree with him on this point. They felt the Bible did allow for music and that it was a good gift of God to be used in worship service. Zwingli desired what he called true religion. He was all about drinking in the purity of the gospel. He was weary of any add-ons to the simple message presented by the apostles in Scripture. He just wanted to drink from the pure fountains of gospel with Luther. He says this, quote, If Luther has drunk where we have drunk, then he has in common with us the evangelical doctrine. As far as we are able, we drink the gospel doctrine out of the true fountains, without which no one can be blessed. Zwingli was thoroughly convinced that in Christ we possess all that we need and that we can trust God with that. He was convinced, as the Apostle Paul told the Romans, In Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Talking about what true versus false religion is, Zwingli says this, quote, The true religion of Christ then consists in this, that wretched men despairs of himself and rests all his thought and confidence on God, sure that he can refuse nothing who has given us his son for us, and that the son who is equally God with the father can refuse nothing since he is ours. But false religion merely juggles with the name of Christ, having its hope elsewhere. For to wash away his sins, one man hires drunken singers, another monks to engage in empty psalmody. One thinks to purchase blessedness by building pretentious churches, Another by having costly raiment made for some saint. One rests on his own works, another on those of somebody else. In short, there are as many gods as there are cities, for each has some special saint to whom it entrusts its salvation. So also Jeremiah laments, according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. Zwingli can be fun to read because he uses some interesting imagery in describing the Christian life. He believed humans, unlike other animals, are spiritually, what he said, amphibious. Zwingli writes, quote, God has willed that man be an amphibian among creatures, living sometimes on earth, sometimes in heaven, and while on earth, sometimes winning, sometimes yielding, he wins if he remains loyal to Christ, his head. Here's a further point about Zwingli's life, the Marburg Colloquy. Sadly, one of the things that Zwingli is most well known for is his disagreements with Martin Luther, especially his disagreement with Luther concerning the Lord's Supper. In 1529, a German political leader who was sympathetic to the reformers called together a group of important Reformation leaders from Germany and Switzerland and other areas of Europe to discuss who they, how they could move forward on a united front politically. Over 50 of the foremost leaders came together, the two most important being Luther and Zwingli. Luther was reluctant to come because he felt he and Zwingli were miles apart concerning how the church needed to be reformed. Zwingli opened the Marburg meeting with a humble prayer asking for God to draw the hearts of the congregated reformers together. Zwingli prayed this, quote, Fill us, O Lord, and Father of us all, we beseech thee with thy gentle spirit, and dispel on both sides all the clouds of misunderstanding and passion. Make an end to the strife of blind fury. Arise, O Christ, thou Son of righteousness, and shine upon us. And to a certain extent, this prayer would be answered, and Luther would be more sympathetic to Zwingli than ever before, even agreeing on 14 out of the 15 main points 
of the Reformed doctrine that was drawn up. Last month, one of the handouts included the 15 Marburg Articles, and they nicely summarize early Reformational doctrine. Concerning Luther and Zwingli's differences on the Lord's Supper, which was their main point of disagreement, Luther's favorite verse was this, the statement of Jesus, this is my body. Zwingli's was this, another statement of Jesus, it is the spirit that gives life, the flesh is of no avail. Zwingli felt that Christ was not speaking literally when he said the bread was his body, but rather speaking figuratively. Christ had said, of course, that he was a door and a vine, but nobody thinks Jesus is literally a door and vine, but they understand Jesus speaking symbolically. Zwingli felt that that was the kind of speech Jesus was using in the upper room, figurative speech. And of course, Luther was not convinced. The theologian Timothy George says of this great divide over interpretations of the Lord's Supper this, quote, One of the great tragedies of Reformation history was that so much strife and hurt occurred around the meal that Jesus intended as a supper of peace. The table of unity became the main point of division among the Reformers. The second point here is Wingley's view of the sacraments as it ties into this. In 1527, two years before the meeting at Marburg, Zwingli put his feelings about Luther like this, quote, You were that one Hercules who dealt with any trouble that arose anywhere. You would have cleansed the Ogene stable if you had the images removed, if you had not taught the body of Christ was supposed to be eaten in the bread. Zwingli felt Luther had not cleaned up the church house enough. He had opened some windows, brought fresh air, and but still kept too many Catholic things in the church, he felt, especially concerning the sacraments. So what was Zwingli's view of the sacraments? Zwingli believed that the Old Testament foreshadowed the New Testament sacraments, in one, the Passover lamb, foreshadowing communion, and two, circumcision, foreshadowing baptism. This is one reason why Zwingli believed infant baptism was a good thing. Some of his later followers would say that he, too, left the Ogene stable uncleansed at this point. One of the reasons why he wanted to retain infant baptism was because of how he viewed circumcision as an Old Covenant shadow of baptism. He reasoned that if the Old Covenant included babies in their covenant, wouldn't the better New Covenant include them as well? Or are they truly excluded from the covenant community. <clears throat> Next month, we will get into the reformers that disagreed with Swingley on inf- infant baptism, the Anabaptists. Interestingly, much of Zwingli's influence in the world is among those who do not practice infant baptism. The Zwinglian scholar Jim West seems to think what many lovers of Zwingli's do when he says this, quote, Zwingli was wrong about two things, infant baptism and Mary. Like almost all reformers, Zwingli believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary, and he even preached a sermon on it in 1522 titled, The Perpetual Virginity of Mary, the Mother of Jesus Christ, Our Savior. But back to the two sacraments. Zwingli saw the Old Covenant sacraments as harsh, harsh, because they both involved the shedding of blood, the shedding of the lamb and the cutting of the foreskin. But in the New Testament, he says this, quote, These most friendly elements and signs, water and wine and bread, have been given to us in order that by the outward signs we may know the grace and loving kindness of the New Testament, that we are no longer under the law. The shedding of blood has therefore been abrogated by the blood of Christ, but under grace. While Zwingli might be said to have downplayed the role of the supper amongst the reformers, Toward the end of his life, he also said some things uh, that were strongly favorable and almost seemed to paint the supper as more than something that is just symbolic. In his exposition of the faith, he has this to say about the Lord's Supper, quote, With the sight we see the bread and wine which in Christ said signify his goodness and favorable disposition. It is not therefore the handmaid of faith, for it sees Christ before it as it were, and the soul is inflamed by his beauty and loves him most dearly. With a sense of touch, we take the bread into our hands, and in signification, it is no longer bread, but Christ. 
And there is also a place for taste and smell in order that we may taste and see how good the Lord is and how blessed is the man that trusts in him. For just as these senses take pleasure in food and are stimulated by it, so the soul exalts and rejoices when it tastes the sweet savor of heavenly hope. Concerning baptism, Zwingli believed that there was nothing special about the water that was being poured over you or that you were being dunked under in baptism. For Zwingli, baptism was about the public answer of a good conscience toward God, as it is put in 1 Peter 3, rather than the taking away of the filth of the flesh. Zwingli writes this of baptism, quote, Water baptism is nothing but an external ceremony, that is, an outward sign that we are incorporated and engrafted into the Lord Jesus Christ and pledged to live to him and to follow him. And as in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creature, the living of a new life, so it is not baptism which saves us, but a new life that saves Zwingli also had an interesting view of John telling us that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit in fire. Remember when John said that about Jesus? <laughs> Whereas many people will interpret Jesus' baptism in fire as having to do with the final judgment of the wicked. I remember I, I actually ran a poll on that one time, and like 90% felt Jesus was talking about the final judgment of the wicked. Zwingli saw it, I think he saw it correctly as baptism in the fire of God's love, that is, for all of Jesus' disciples. He summarizes the message of John the Baptist like this, quote, I am only a weak vessel. The message which I can bear is only outward. I cannot give anything but external water ba- baptism in water. I have no power to soften the heart. But the one who comes after me has greater power than I have. He is able to penetrate to the heart. He will baptize you inwardly with his spirit, setting you on fire with his love and endowing you with the gift of tongues. Christ lights on fire the soul with baptism in the fires of his love. This inward baptism for Zwingli is more powerful than the outward water baptism, though the outward baptism is still important. This is also not to say Zwingli was proto-Pentecostal, He felt the gift of tongues was rare and that it didn't always accompany the baptism of God's fiery love. Another point about Zwingli. Zwingli was a champion of the poor. Zwingli said this, quote, For the sake of God's glory, one should clothe the living images of God, the poor Christians, and not idols of wood and stone. Timothy George comments on this saying, quote, For many centuries, wealthy citizens had endowed masses for the dead which were supposed to speed up their journey through purgatory. When the mass was abolished in Zwinglian territories, these endowments were converted into a kind of charitable trust for the poor whose needs, Zwingli believed, were more pressing than those of the already departed. I think many of us would agree with Zwingli there. Another point about Zwingli's theology on purgatory and limbo. Zwingli said concerning purgatory, I believe that the figment of purgatorial fire is as much an affront to the redemption of Christ freely granted to us as it has been a lucrative business to its authors. Concerning limbo, Zwingli had a somewhat radical belief for his time that even unbaptized children of Christians were saved. Limbo in Catholic tradition was a place between heaven and hell almost like an air-conditioned compartment in hell for those who were pretty good pagans. It was a figment of the imagination for people to try to reconcile what God would do with good people who hadn't received the gospel and forgiveness of sins. In Zurich, babies were buried in the middle of the cemetery to represent their state in limbo. Zwingli did away with this practice of burying babies in between the sacred and non-sacred parts of the church cemeteries. He thought that was ridiculous. Another point of Zwingli's theology, priestly celibacy. Like all other reformers, Zwingli felt mandated celibacy for priests was satanic. Not just bad, but satanic. He said this, quote, The prohibition of the clergy uh, of marriage comes from the devil, not from God. Another thing about Zwingli, uh, on the Apocrypha, 
People who have read the Apocrypha tend to immediately pick up on the fact that it doesn't quite have the same feel or sense as the other 66 books of the Bible. Zwingli felt this way too. He said, quote, They are more diluted and feebler so that they appear rather as imitations of the former scriptures than written in the peculiar fervor of the fresh spirit. It actually wasn't until the Council of Trent in 15 years after the death of Zwingli that the Apocrypha was officially recognized as being on the same level of authority as the other 66 books of the Bible. Some say the reason the Catholics did this was so they could defend some of their more indefensible traditions like prayer to the saints, righteousness through works, and other things. And the last point, Zwingli's death. Zwingli's death. We hinted on this in the beginning. Michael Reeves writes of Zwingli's death like this. On October 11th, outside Zurich at the Battle of Kefel, the two armies locked horns. There was no contest. The forces of Zurich were easily smashed, and Zwingli himself badly wounded. Finding himself unable to move, the victorious soldiers demanded that he pray to the Virgin Mary. He refused, and so Captain Fuckinger of Unterwalden stabbed him to death, leaving his men to quarter the body and burn it. As a final gesture, they then mixed his ashes with dung to prevent him from ever being turned into a relic. So... That was the fate of Zwingli. But what were his last words? This gives hope. Zwingli's last words. He said this, You may kill the body, but you cannot kill the soul. And that to him is what was primary in his teaching. The spiritual and heavenly over the fleshly and earthly. The word from above over the word from below. And Zwingli's influence would stretch out it would stretch out to Calvin, to the Swiss Anabaptist brethren, and to the radical Puritans of England and New England. He would go from a mercenary of Switzerland to a mercenary of Christ. He would be enlisted in the Lord's army. He said this, In the business of Christian religion and faith, we have long staked our lives and set our minds on pleasing only our heavenly captain, in whose troop and company we have had ourselves enlisted. He also said, To have held fast to the purpose of the Lord is to conquer all adversaries. And finally, he said this, do something bold for God's sake. And that is the Swiss mercenary of Christ, Holdrick Zwingli. Any questions? um, Can someone take out this? I mean... uh, Bring the mic. I'm sorry, the battle that he fought where he died, what was that? Who was, how did that come about? Who was that against exactly? Uh, the forces it, against him? Um, it was a Catholic army that was against him. Um, Zwingli, uh, you know, he was stuck in between Catholic France and Catholic Italy. And so at times, the Zurichers and Switzerland in general would try to make al- alliances with others. I'm, I'm actually not sure which force that was at that time that he died under, if it was Italians or French. Yeah, any other question? But they were a Catholic army. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 